Well, good afternoon, everyone. I believe we're live now with our Teams event. This is uh, one in what we hope could be a series of uh, outreach events to make sure that we're communicating with working folks around the state of Michigan to let them know what we're doing at the state of Michigan on behalf of uh, working people and businesses as it relates to COVID workplace safety. My name is Sean Egan. I'm the Director of COVID Workplace Safety for the state of Michigan, and I am a, in a weird place. And there's some people listening to me that probably didn't want to hear me today. Uh, we had a, a family uh, appointment that we had to make. And as you can see, like we all need to do right now, we're masked up Michigan to make sure that we're helping contain and prevent the spread of COVID. What we know from the science right now is that we can reduce the transmission of COVID if we're all wearing masks by about 70%. Uh, which is hugely critical. Um, as you all know, there's a lot of noise around COVID. There's certainly a 24 seven news cycle that never is relentless on the information that we're receiving. But some of the things that we do know for sure are that this largely spreads through large respiratory droplets that we expel from each other when we talk, sneeze or cough. And we can help mitigate the risk of transmission by keeping that social distance, that six feet of separation, which lets gravity and natural air kind of dilute or eliminate the possible transmission or we can wear these face coverings or preferably some combination of both. So uh, these are tools that are necessary to help us move forward to get our economy open, to keep our economy open and and hopefully all of you are doing everything you can every day to make sure that you're following those practices. Certainly that includes good hygiene practices, the old sneeze into your elbow, wash your hands, uh, regularly and frequently don't touch your eyes, nose or mouth after you touch other surfaces that may have been uh, in, have had exposure to COVID. Uh, make sure that you're wearing these face coverings when you're outdoors within six feet of each other or indoors all the time to make sure that we're cutting down the spread of COVID. I can assure you that the governor and uh, Dr. J at DHHS are working tirelessly watching the numbers, watching what's happening to make sure that we can uh, all, all stay safe to save Michigan lives, but also to make sure that we can get open and stay open and keep our economy moving forward. So I'm going to cover a few resources that we have with you today. Uh, you can see the PowerPoint slide on your screen or you're seeing now you can. Uh, you're, you can see that. Uh, one of the things I'm doing as the director of COVID workplace safety is making sure that we are coordinating across agencies. That includes local public health, local business organizations, chambers, uh, DHHS, LARA and licensing divisions and everyone else to try to make sure that we're all tackling this problem the most effectively and efficiently as possible. We're spending a lot of our time and effort making making sure that we're educating not only businesses and workplaces, but as uh, all of you that are, are with us today to that you know what you need to do and you know what tools are available to help you understand uh, how we're going to fight this uh, disease. So we've created uh, over the past several months some wonderful websites for you. We have COVID-19 workplace safety. As you can see the web address there, this is a great, great resource for everybody. It includes guidance for every industry that's been named in the state of Michigan uh, in an executive order that they need to be doing. If your industry is not named, you are going to want to look at the general industry guidelines. Those will be included in those specifically named guidelines uh, and we have those for every industry. So when you're thinking about what needs to be happening in your workplace or your business, check those out and make sure you're following those. Those are developed and created by MyOSHA, the agency responsible for workplace safety in Michigan, and they include the CDC guidelines as well as the executive orders. So all the tools you need are there. Our team has been put together a lot of great handouts fact sheets, posters, including masking requirement posters, uh, social media tools and other things that you can use there. We also have a link over to the Michigan Ec Economic Development Corporation's Peer Michigan Business Connect, which is uh, Michigan manufacturers that can provide workplaces or businesses with PPE, hand sanitizer, plastic barriers, you name it, they have it. I talk with them regularly and there's definitely capacity uh, for folks out there. We have a link over to the My Symptoms app which is a DHHS created app that can help with the health screenings. When we think of workplace safety, we always want to try to eliminate the hazard. So health screening is critical. So if you're sick of the health screening you got to do at work, the goal there is to identify and remove potential COVID before it can spread around the workplace. And the My Symptoms app's easy way to do it. Businesses just sign up. They'll get a, a specific identification number they share with their employees. It's going to ask you just a, a few questions every single day. 
yes, 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 or no, no, no. And that'll help spot if you have some of those potential symptoms of COVID. And then of course we do have a link to the state safe start plan, which everybody is quite familiar with now that has the phases of reopening as well as the regions of the state. That plan uh, kind of highlights what can happen in different phases of COVID transmission. I know that we're all watching those dashboards that the governor and Dr. J talk about regularly. And one of the things they're looking at there on those numbers per day is what what is the community transmission that's happening there? And it, obviously as that gets larger, it spreads faster and farther, and that's a real problem. Uh, while we do know that, uh, you know, different age groups have different risk levels, uh, you know, it's really affecting all age groups in very different ways all of the time. We're seeing young people die and old people live and vice versa. And uh, this is truly, truly a very critical uh, moment for us in the state of Michigan. And, and, you know, we're working hard to do these things. All of the materials available I mentioned there, posters, fact sheets, you name it. We tried to make it very, very simple. There is a sample exposure control plan that you can take take a look at. All of these wonderful posters the team has put together on the, the masking, uh, no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no services up there somewhere. Links to knowing your rights and things that you can do, uh, and, as well as other things that businesses need to be doing. And most importantly, and a wonderful tool that Myosha developed for everybody, employers and employees alike, is a hotline that can be used. It's 855 SAFE C19. If you have questions about workplace safety, either as an employer or an employee, you can call right in directly to Myosha and ask those experts the questions that you need. If you're an employee calling in and your issue is uh, it's necessary that it needs to move to a complaint, they will help you do that. If you're an employer calling in and you need further consultation, they will get you over to their wonderful consultation team, which will work with you without threat of uh, 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 citations or other means. They can come right to your workplace. Uh, certainly if there's a complaint filed, that's a different process, but these tools are there for you to help us all navigate what's necessary with COVID. And I know that we did get some uh, questions coming in early. Some of those, you know, we would defer over to the Myosha experts as well. So I'm really excited about uh, how many people are participating today. Like I said, if this works well, we want to try to make it a recurring event so that we can reach out to as many people as possible, try to answer questions and provide information that's up to date uh, as often as possible. We really, really need to hear what's happening on the ground and we really need to make sure that we have a way to connect with all of you to get the information out there. So uh, I, I'll stop there so we can get into the Q&A segment and I appreciate everybody joining us today. Thanks for that, Sean. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Erica, and I'm going to be moderating the Q&A. And for those of you who haven't seen that functionality, there's a Q&A tab. Simply submit your questions, and I'm going to read through uh, and uh, hand your questions over to Sean for addressing. So with that, we'll go ahead and jump in. Sean, the first question we have is from Patty, and she asks, does my office need to require the wearing of masks if they are closed to the public? Absolutely. Uh, what you want to look at, Patty, there is the office guidelines I mentioned on that website, as well as Executive Order 145, which includes specific requirements for different types of workplaces. And in any setting, indoor or uh, at work, um, if you cannot maintain that social distancing, uh, you're going to need to wear a mask because that's going to cut down on the spread of COVID. Uh, if you're in common areas, you're going to need to wear a mask. If you're going through hallways or other places where you may uh, cross paths with somebody, you're going to need to wear that face covering. Now, I know we get a question about like, you know, my private office and stuff. Obviously, where you can maintain that social distance, uh, that's not going to be an issue. But what we really want you to focus in on is when you're going to be crossing paths, when people are going to get too close together, because we need to do both that social distancing and then uh, the mask to cut down. All right, and how about this one? If the workplace is hot and masks are increasing the heat while a person is working, can the employee work without a mask for a while? So in certain workplaces where you can maintain that social distancing, as we all know, like construction opened first, right? Because that's considered a lower risk one where employees typically are segregated quite a ways away from each other and the public is never ever coming in there. So if your workplace, uh, for example, you're on one end of, of some area and the other workers are 25, 30 feet away from you, 
likely under the executive order, you're going to be able to take off that face covering. But if you're within that six feet spacing, you're going to need to wear that face covering at all time. And I know that it's hot. Uh, what I didn't tell most of you is that uh, I am a licensed electrician as well, so I know exactly what people are talking about. Uh, it's hot, it's miserable, and these things don't help with that. Uh, but you're going to need to do that if you're not going to able to maintain that social distance. All right, and if someone in your office tests positive, what is the course of action for that office? So employers have an obligation to keep all of your information as private as possible, but what they're going to need to do is contact tracing. So first and foremost, they're going to need to isolate that person and get them out of the workplace if they are not already. Then they're going to need to identify whom that person has been close to or around and start having discussions with those folks too. Now, if you had a really limited engagement, there may be may not be anything to work about, but if you work in a cubicle cluster and there's no social distancing, uh, there, you know, there might be other steps that they need to take. And certainly they're going to need to do a deep cleaning of wherever that person may have been working in that workplace. Uh, and the, our guidelines as well as the CDC have an outline of what that sort of deep cleaning looks like. Okay. This next question comes from an anonymous guest here who looks like she has an underlying health condition. She says, I work in a condition. <laughs> let me start over. I work in a kitchen where it's almost impossible to distance from each other for eight plus hours. It gets extremely hot and I have asthma. Am I expected to wear my mask for my entire shift? What are the repercussions of not wearing the mask and can my employer fire me? So uh, the short answer is there's a couple of executive orders that deal with uh, food preparation in particular, and it, there's uh, one specifically for restaurants, which already requires that cooks have to wear a face covering anytime they're preparing food. So certainly if you're in the kitchen and doing that, you're going to need to wear that um, all of the time anyway. Uh, certainly if you can't maintain social distancing. If you do have a medical condition, I would encourage you to request an accommodation with your employer, which may include for you uh, the ability to take more breaks to kind of be able to relieve, take take the mask off, whether you're going outside or wherever you may be, that you're going to be able to socially dis distance yourself from others. Uh, but, you know, there might be that might be an opportunity for you to get some relief from wearing the mask. But in general, yes, uh, based on that example, you're going to be wearing that mask for likely the, your whole shift. Great. All right. And what happens if a worker still tests positive after two and a half weeks and the doctor tells them they are no longer contagious? Can they come back to work? The CDC says after two negative tests, they can come back. Uh, so the CDC actually has other guidelines too without testing for people that are diagnosed uh, with COVID and it can be a certain amount of time, symptom free, et cetera. But if you've tested positive, even though you have no symptoms, you are contagious. So the, you should not absolutely not be in the workplace and you should continue to be uh, isolating yourself and keeping yourself uh, away from others to, to the best of your ability. All right. Does wearing a face covering under the executive order 2020-147 surpass my usual workplace mask wearing protocols? If you're in a public business or an enclosed, you know, open to the public, uh, certainly you're going to be wearing a mask all the time. But for the workplace, primarily, you're going to want to look to Executive Order 145 and the, the requirements in each of the different types of workplaces. So 147 dealt specifically with the individual's responsibility to wear a face covering in an enclosed public space or outdoors when we can't maintain that social distance. The workplace requirements are included in 145 and then a couple of others that have to do specifically with food and, and meat packing and some other pieces. All right. Our next question says, as long as I wear my mask into work, after my temp is taken and my questions answered, is it safe to remove my mask once I'm in my office with the door closed? When people enter or leave the area, I reapply the mask. I think based on that set of circumstances, uh, it would be yes. In an office setting where you can maintain that social distancing uh, of six feet and people aren't interacting with you, you have an, if you're lucky enough to have your own enclosed office in your office, certainly you could take that mask off. But as soon as you leave or people are coming in, you're going to need to put that back on. 
All right. Does the mask requirement trump a requirement for safety glasses when the mask causes the glasses to fog in a hot and humid machining environment? Uh, you're going to need to do both. You're not going to. It's it's not going to be one or the other. It's going to be both. These face coverings are critical to preventing the transmission of COVID. So, you're going to need the cloth mask. And as you can all see, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you just tuned in, I had a family appointment that came up, and I'm in a public place, so I'm wearing my mask, and I I do wear glasses. And every time I breathe, they are fogging up, and then it's going away. And uh, these are things that we're going to have to fight through. Uh, you know, for the while we're fighting COVID. All right, and Tiffany has joined us and asks, does an office that is not open to the general public but does have FedEx janitors, et cetera, um, for example, an engineering office, does the mandatory mask order apply? And if so, will there be an official clarification for this? So I think it's important here to note what being open to the public means, and that's going to be uh, people can kind of enter freely and otherwise with the fedex and other things custodians you can set parameters on how they get in or out uh, there's a health screening component for certain probably temporary staff or contractors fedex may not fall into that but these are uh, that's not going to be considered getting a delivery wouldn't be considered that you're suddenly open to the public because you can control that environment that person's going to need to come in uh, potentially do the health screening that you're doing for your other employees uh, although fedex drivers are supposed to be doing that anyway and or ups or others and uh, you're going to be making sure that they're wearing a, a face covering and other and uh, the other things that they're supposed to be doing Right. All right. And this one you touched on a little bit already, Sean, but um, if you could just go over the executive order, uh, we've got a question. Does executive order 2020-147 cancel uh, 145? They seem to have conflicting mask guidelines uh, with 145 saying masks are mandatory unless you can maintain six feet of social distancing, um, whereas 140 says, says at all times indoors in public space. Yeah, I think uh, to that question again, I think uh, make sure when we're reading 147 that what we're seeing, right? This is uh, a mask requirement that's specific to individuals when they're going outdoors or into an enclosed public space. So if we cannot maintain that social distancing or we're going indoors in a public space. So what does public mean, right? A manufacturer facility is not public. They can control who's coming in and going out and we can do the health screening to make sure that we're keeping COVID out of the workplace. When we're thinking about a public space like a retail store or gas station or something, the store itself is gonna have very limited control over who's coming in or out. Uh, and that's gonna be that public environment. So when you're thinking about your work place look at 145 uh, when you're thinking about what you need to do as an individual think about 147 and as a business we know that 147 requires them to decline service to those that are not wearing face coverings so that's an additional piece and the goal of that is to protect employees when we have high community transmission uh, you know somewhere 40 plus percent of the folks that are spreading this virus are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic think about that that means they feel fine so uh, without that type of requirement that they're not going to be very likely to wear a face covering and that's going to impact us all. All right, are manufacturing plants required to wear a mask all times in a warehouse setting? No, you're going to fall under the provisions of uh, Executive Order 145 or you know whatever order may come later um, that if you can maintain that social distancing, you you can be without a mask. But as soon as you're going to encroach in common areas, break rooms, whatever, where you're going to start getting within that six feet of spacing from an, one another, you're going to need to wear the face covering. And then, as we all know in, in workplaces, if you're going to be within three feet, you need to also put on a face shield. All right. Uh, and what is the responsibility of my employer to let me know about coworkers who test positive? Is it enough to say that someone has it or should they provide dates, times and locations as is done with contact tracing in general? So the employers are doing that contact tracing now because of uh, uh, it, some privacy laws, you know, and ADA and some other things, uh, they should not be coming out and telling you like, hey, Sean, 
you know, I'm Sean. Sean uh, tested positive. It should be, we had an employee that should be working with that employee in that area to identify who they may have interacted with. And those are the folks that are going to be to need to know. Uh, in some places, that might be everybody in the office. In some places, if I work in the front, uh, it's, you know, 5,000 square foot facility, I work in the front 100 square feet. There's no reason for them to say anything more than, you know, we've identified a case and it's, it, you know, we've handled it to everybody in the back. All right. Will my OSHA be following OSHA's temporary enforcement guideline, guidelines regarding N95 fit testing requirements? For example, can hospitals suspend fit testing with PPE resource constraints? Hospitals cannot suspend initial fit testing. Uh, it's, an, it's important to make this distinction. The OSHA temporary guidelines uh, allowed a suspension of the annual fit testing, the annual recertification, and that's provided that you know, pretty much you're the same as you were last year. You know, if you've had uh, something happen to you where you've lost a lot of weight or you've gained a lot of weight or maybe you got in a car accident, unfortunately, and had a change in your uh, makeup uh, where the that, that previous fit testing is clearly not going to work, um, then they're still going to need to do that. But those guidelines only suspended the annual fit testing. So if you are new to the N95 environment, you're going to still need to do an actual fit test to make sure that that mask is performing at the level it's supposed to. All right, our next question is from TJ. If a, co if, sorry, if a worker's significant other tests positive for COVID-19, what course of action do we need to take to protect our workers? We are having all our workers tested. I just want to make sure that we are doing our due diligence. So that would count as a potential close contact. If we look at the executive orders, it talks about isolation and other things for those with close contact. So I think you'd want to talk with that worker about uh, an immediate family member in the household that's tested positive. Clearly, uh, that person is having close contact with them and you'd want to think about how you might be able to put them on leave for a couple of weeks through a quarantine or some other uh, uh, some other mechanism there to make sure that you're not introducing it into the workplace. We know that's a huge challenge out there is that, you know, we can control the environment of the workplace, but we we all have our lives and we're going to go do things and our family members are going to do things and this illness is going to happen and we just need to plan and prepare for what we do when that happens. And is the employer responsible for contacting the local health department if an employee tests positive? Yes, that's explicitly clear in the executive order. One of the things I would mention about that My Symptoms app that I, I started off with in the presentation is that I, I believe in that app you'll find in the FAQs that if you have a positive, uh, it'll handle that part too. Perfect. Um, and we have a question here from Steve Claywell. What can employers and businesses do to protect their workers and general public that may not be practiced currently? Would you read that one one more time, Erica? Absolutely. What can employers and businesses do to protect their workers and the general public that may not be practiced currently? Well, I, th I, I think just being very mindful, as I mentioned at the outset, of how this thing spreads and looking at your workplace and really thinking through, you know, do I need more physical barriers? Is there a way? So here's here's an example, right? So we saw in, uh, a bar in Lansing had a big outbreak, and one of the things that you saw there was people were lining up outside. I mean, uh, that employer could have thought through how do how can I break up these lines if people are lining up outside? How do I get people out of the line knowing that you know yet yeah, I have capacity limits indoors? But just communication, um, thinking through how the virus spreads, uh, making sure that you're encouraging and requiring people to mask up, uh, you know, really just continuing to be thoughtful day in and day out about you know how, is there is there one more thing that I can do that will help whomever's around me, whoever's coming in here prevent the spread of this disease and uh, you know together we'll do that and be ready to w work with my OSHA or your local public health or your uh, you know uh, licensing agency or whomever else that you're normally working with because I can tell you that our goal is to teach educate work together learn what's happening in the field 
provide uh, the tools that we can create from the state and make sure that everybody has those. So, uh, you know, what's that one more thing that I could be doing that's going to help make sure that somebody doesn't get this disease and potentially die? Thanks for that, Sean. Our next question is from Layton. Um, if a worker tests positive, who, if anyone else, must quarantine for 14 days, or can they simply produce a negative test to continue working? Um, so that's going to depend on how close and how long the contact was. The employer should be doing contact tracing. I would encourage them to work with their local public health departments too to help identify who might have been exposed long enough that could be, have become infected with the disease. Um, if you did test positive, a negative test does not get you out of the quarantine period, just so you know. So uh, you, you, if you test positive, you're still going to need to do that 14 day quarantine period uh, before you can come back to work. And a negative test even in between there is not going to alleviate that. All right, and Mike asks, in an office environment and if an employee leaves the premise for an appointment, should their temperature um, be checked and questionnaire be asked again. So it sounds like if they're leaving their work site and sure. an appointment or lunch and coming back, do they go through the health screening again? Uh, yes, if you are doing the temperature screening, uh, I would encourage you to do it again. And the health screening, it, you know, frankly, is just a couple of questions. So I would encourage you just to do that again. All right, we've had a, some really great um, participation and questions that have come in. We're about out of time. I'm going to read one last question and then after that, uh, Sean, you can let us know if you have anything to add before we close out um, this event. So our last question for today is if a construction site has many subcontractors at the job site, including out of state contractors, are the workers required to wear masks at all times when working indoors, even if they can somewhat maintain six feet of social distancing most of the time? So the short answer to that is that if they can, the most of the time is the problem, but if they can maintain, clearly maintain six feet of social distancing, even indoors, uh, under Executive Order 145, they would not be required to wear the face coverings. My Let's make a stretch goal recommendation is that if we are indoors, barring us being in a huge setting where we are clearly very, very far apart, wear the mask. We know it cuts transmission by about 70%. Just wear the face coverings to help protect us all and protect our economy, frankly. All right, anything else you wanted to add, Sean? Um, I would just like uh, again like to thank everybody for joining in today. I know that uh, we're having a lot of conversations about this. We're going to continue to have a lot of conversations about COVID and things as as they develop and change. We know that we uh, the governor has put forth probably what science is telling us is the absolute strongest tool to deal with this that you see me wearing as well is that we mask up Michigan that we can prevent the spread of COVID if we are preventing it from escaping our own bodies and that most people that are not most, but many, a large uh, portion of the people that are spreading this thing don't even know they have it. They feel fine. So this is a very small tool in a very inexpensive way for us to help get open and stay open. <laughs>